Hi everyone, good morning. This is Elsa and this is day four of my daily reflections. Um, you know, I started this because we are in lockdown mode in Mumbai, India, and there are several of us all over the world also in the same situation due to COVID-19. And in my conversation with many people, a lot of them said that they were struggling. They, they were trying to get into a routine. They were trying to figure out how to stay positive because there are so many negative reports, especially on WhatsApp. So take a digital break sometimes, but do tune in every morning at 10 a.m. Indian time so that you can share my uh, daily reflections with, you know, with my friends. So today I have um, Manira Alva. She's a dear friend from Vital Voices. She is uh, the Vice President Political and Civil Engagement at uh, Vital Voices. Welcome, Manira. You're joining us from New Jersey. So it's half past midnight. Thank you for staying away. <laughs> Hi, Elsa. Good morning. It's good morning for me too. So that's okay. <laughs> it's 12.30. Yeah. <laughs> so Manira, how's it, what's it like in New Jersey? Because that's another hot spot, right? Yeah, it's... Uh, it's it's sane. Let's put it that way. We can still uh, go outside. We can go to the parks, uh, walk around, uh, kind of just keep the distance. Uh, essential services, groceries and everything uh, are, are open so you can go out, do your marketing and things like that. And uh, the idea is basically try and keep to your unit, uh, try and keep to being at home. Schools uh, are kind of uh, have been um, discontinued till September. So everything is online. So it's a new set of challenges. It's it's several people in the same house trying to find their corner, get online, talk softly and, uh, you know, hold their little space uh, at different times of the day. So that has been a little challenging. But life in New Jersey, it's it's literally like there's a calm and there's the expectation of a storm, but you don't know when it's going to hit. You see the numbers increasing, but all of us are really watching New York pretty closely. I, I live maybe a 45 minute ride away. And um, I think uh, when, uh, you know, we saw Floyd Cardoz pass away, it was a real shakeup because happened to have met him at some point in time. And the minute you start to hear of people, you know, um, you know, uh, falling victim to it, then it's, it starts to get a little real. So otherwise, it's it's pretty sane. It's quiet. Spring is in the air, which is beautiful. The birds are chirping. There's greenery. And there's all this information that we're dealing with. So kind of a paradox. So one of the things you said is that, um, you know, you, I mean, when we were chatting before, you actually for work live in Virginia, but you made the, an executive decision to uh, jump on the train and yeah. head to New, York, New Jersey so that you could stay with your family. So mm -hmm. this is a moment where we are appreciating that, yes, whilst we are locked down, we also have a chance to spend uh, precious time with our family mm -hmm. members, you know, given that we all have a very hectic lives. So can you share a little bit about, um, you know, when a family, you know, works, uh, constantly and maybe travels a lot and lives in different cities and then finally comes together. Um, you know, what is that experience like? Is it, uh, you know, learning to adjust with each other all over again? Or is it, um, you know, fun and games every day? It's awesome parent revenge. That's all I can <laughs> say. Because I have a 20 year old who was, who was traveling around Europe and did really want to head back. He came uh, a month or a couple of months back and was planning to get set again. And this stuff happened. So it's lovely to just be the four of us together. Haven't really lived together since he went to university a couple of years ago. I think it's really difficult on the kids. Uh, it's difficult for me because my music taste is a little different. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of very different, very loud, what I would call sometimes offensive music. Uh, 
but we're all learning you know it's it's fun so the other day my son tells me he says i've figured this thing out there's only one way i can get through this i said and what are you going to do he says i'm going to be up all night and i'm you know going to get up in the afternoon so that i have to hang out with you guys only from maybe 2 to 10 and and i get my space uh, for the rest of the day so we do lovely walks uh, uh, with a dog we have an in- incredibly sweet uh, lovable dog so there's a lot of walks that happen uh we're thinking of maybe getting the garden set uh a little kind of stuff at home uh, a lot of cooking together a lot of cooking i mean there's no <laughs> cooking <laughs> no i imagine by the time you finish breakfast it's like okay what's for lunch and then it's like okay what about tea and then you know you you're done and it's already dinner time so a lot of uh, cooking and interesting stuff but I really see this time as a blessing because I think in in the way that our lives are are structured at least before this before I I came to Vital Voices before I moved back to the US in 2016 I had a lot of time with family and I felt uh, that in the last 3 4 years it had kind of you know had become less you think the kids are growing up 16 and 20 they want their space it's more friends they're doing their stuff It's been a fantastic experience to just reconnect and uh, I I think this is the last time we'll all be in such close quarters I'm pretty sure about that. And so we should make the most of it, right? Yeah, I am just enjoying it. I mean, I love it. <laughs> I'm a Vital Voices fellow and uh, Vital Voices is such an amazing network and you're a vice president over there leading the political and civil engagement uh, vertical. Uh can you share a little bit about uh, you know the women you work with the amazing women you work with the uh, what a uh, program you lead because I think our viewers would really appreciate it. So it is um you know if if um, if the lord would appear to appear to me and say so manira what would you like to do uh what i'm doing right now it it would be it uh, made to order i uh was born into a family of of uh politicians and stuff raised really by a woman politician and um maybe for some part of my life thought that was my, that would be my journey and uh and then i get to work with incredible women politicians from around the world i get a blank canvas to figure out a program for them on how to uh what should i say maybe if there are any trainings that they may need if there is any skilling that they might require how do we really back them up how do we create stuff for them that really makes them go that distance not drop out uh the minute it's overwhelming or there's pressure so every year we have a cohort of about 25 women politicians from around the world and uh we figure out these incredible training programs for them a lot of stuff from the Harvard Kennedy School a lot of uh, we have a partnership with the Council of World Women Leaders which is all former women prime ministers and presidents from around the world and uh, they mentor them through uh through the year so uh we do two in person convenings we meet for about a week at a time different parts of the world and then we do at least two webinars a month everything from strategic communication to leadership to negotiation mediation uh governance uh, you know uh, whatever you we feel that they might need in their journeys ahead and i have just the most mind blowing cohort right now we have mps from romania from kosovo from sierra leone from uh lebanon and uh, it's just that today in fact we did a a, a whole training on uh, adaptive leadership and how leadership changes in the time of a crisis and uh, you know how how you navigate the path because we we truly believe leadership is not a destination it's a journey and what is it that you need along the way to make this happen and uh, you know we had voices from sierra leone remembering what ebola was like and saying you know we we know the mistakes we made so we're a little more careful now at the same time 
I had an MP from Kosovo say, I have been through a 90 odd day lockdown earlier when, you know, Kosovo was being bombed in the 90s. And uh, that was a different kind of pressure, but that is helping me deal with this right now. And uh, just so much of sharing. And we're also on a WhatsApp group 24 seven where everyone is talking and exchanging stuff. So I know what's happening in governments across the world and, and what countries are doing. And it's, it's, it's just an awesome, awesome privilege to be working with these women, no two ways. That's amazing. I do believe that, um, you know, we need more women leadership and therefore this particular program that you happen to lead at Vital Voices is so very critical at this point. And uh, it's my belief that uh, once this crisis is over, many more women hopefully will step up and take up leadership positions, whether it's in business or corporate or, um, you know, government. We need them at all levels because um, you know, that kind of empathy and the sense of community comes very naturally mm -hmm. to women. Mm -hmm. And what we are seeing is that when some, some in leadership take decisions, they tend to forget the different kinds of people in the mm -hmm. decision making process. But that's for a different discussion. What I would like to ask you is, can you share some examples from India, women who are stepping up? in the political space you know um, at the local level you know my that's not god it's it's kerala <laughs> right yeah <laughs> it's kk shailaja and uh, in fact uh, uh, her example was used in today's uh, in today's webinar on adaptive leadership on here is this person in the state of kerala who is a scientist by training is a teacher and about, uh, so the whole idea of adaptive leadership is that there is the technical part of the piece, which is keep six feet distance, social distance, do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? Those are the technical aspects. But adaptive leadership is how do we convey these messages in an empathetic and a compassionate manner? And how do we get people to believe that they can do this because it's gonna help them or because it's gonna work for them? And uh, in fact, a lot of her communication about uh, being transparent, about uh, including the opposition in the efforts and stuff like that. So we studied her a lot. And um, in fact, uh, I was saying that we have to try and do something with her. A lot of the fellows said that they would love to hear from her on how she's handling things. And, uh, you know, uh, so to me, uh, KK Shailaja, comes to my mind right away because uh, I've been reading and following her uh, a lot. I think a lot of women journalists and more than anything else, I think there are a lot of people who are also involved in relief work, right? Because I believe we have, uh, you know, when you ask me, it's the middle of the night. This is like, I, I call it my second shift because in the daytime I'm working there and then evening is just dedicated to India and what's happening there and, and stuff like that. And, and uh, it's just, you know, this, this, I don't even know what to, to refer to it as, but this migration of the daily wage laborer and moving back and trying to get back and, and the number of people who are stepping up efforts to try and serve them. I think really this moment is also about average, ordinary, normal, everyday people just stepping up, you know, it's really, that is the bigger story, I think. Uh, and we're seeing it across the world because whenever we are in time of crisis, finally, it is the people who rise up and start to find solutions and start to figure out how they have to get through this, right? And, and that is that moment right now. But if you ask me, top of my head, um, the person I really have been following and studying is KK Shailaja of Kerala. And we want to take a story global for leadership. And I was just reading on one of my Rotary peace groups, you know, because I'm a peace fellow. Mm -hmm. And there is so much of negativity on, uh, and the media only highlights uh, the number of deaths, you mm -hmm. know, everywhere. And um, there's so much of negativity around this issue on the virus. Mm -hmm. um, it's causing a lot of uh, fear and panic and, uh, you know, mental health issues as well. But there mm -hmm. are positive 
stories and they should get airtime and that's why one of the reasons i decided at least on my part to have daily reflections is to highlight you know one the work people are doing but also how they are coping and how they are um, managing their day apart from their work and um, uh, do you think that um, the media has a role to play and that uh, we can do better in the reporting of this virus for these positive stories no the media definitely has a has a massive role to play and uh, so i i was a media person for the first 25 years of my life uh, done news done television done documentary and uh, literally been a part of the group so to say but a lot also depends today on who owns media and what is it that the message has to be and what is it that is going out so we have to be mindful of that as well right yes so again today uh, a really interesting thing that came up in the webinar we did was about loss right and how do you address loss and how loss has to be acknowledged and honored and it has to be seen as a challenge and it is only when you see something as a challenge that you start to think about hope and finding solutions to deal with that challenge. So we can't really say that there is no loss because then we would not be honoring those who, uh, who are, you know, uh, I find it really difficult to say who are victims right now, but it's, it, that's literally it, right? But it's also important, very important to humanize the numbers because every day you just read 850 today, 750 in Italy, 500 in New York, right? But it's about keeping in mind that these are human beings. These are people, these are grandparents. It's trying to imagine a family, a joint family, young kids, five and six, and then a grandparent they've known all their life, 10 or 12 year old kids losing grandparents that they've lived with. So I think a part of leadership is, is respecting that loss and acknowledging it. But at the same time, uh, if there's no hope, then then what, what are we doing, right? So it's about holding on to the stories as well, uh, stories of people giving up ventilators for younger people, stories of, uh, you know, little kids dropping uh, food uh, for the elderly outside their homes. So those are really stories of hope that we have to hold on to. That's so important. We need stories of hope. <laughs> I'm quickly also typing whilst you're speaking so that I can <laughs> capture your key messages. This is a new platform. See, we are all learning new skills. <laughs> well Absolutely, now. yeah. <laughs> I would have never imagined that I was going to ever have, uh, you know, these online conversations or anything like that. So um, coming back to COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, what are the three, what, I won't say three things, maybe just one thing. What is the mm -hmm. one thing that you focus on every day for yourself? Um, you know, I, I shared this with my fellows today when I said, you know, till today, I haven't really woken up a single day in the last three weeks feeling low or depressed. I don't know why. I just I wake up every day and it's like, OK, so what do we need to get done today? And what is it that we have to work on? And, and it's just that being in this network of incredible women, I mean, 18,000 and still counting. And I feel the interaction has increased tremendously. We are hearing of innovative solutions from different parts of the world as they come in. My CEO, Elise Nelson, is doing a daily podcast with women leaders, how they are coping, what's happening. And uh, I don't know. I, I So what do I do for myself? I To keep sane, I go between uh, word puzzles and jigsaws. So while I, I'm doing my stuff, I have a jigsaw happening usually uh, next to me and I keep going back and forth. Our libraries here are all online. So I'm downloading a lot of books, love stories uh, for now, nothing heavy and, and dramatic. And we have incredible uh, family conversations back home. I have three brothers, my mom 
is there too. So we figured WhatsApp can only be four of us. And every time one person was, you know, whoever the first four who got on, the conversation would be with them. So now we have moved to maybe Facebook where all five of us uh, are talking. So a lot more interaction on that side. Um, so that's how, uh, I think that's how I'm getting through right now. But I think really being our fellows who are literally on the front line of defense, right? They are constantly bombarded with information. They know exactly what's happening in their countries. They're very, very um, carrying a huge load. And uh, from India, in fact, uh, Anna Chandy of the Live, Laugh, Love Foundation was supposed to uh, do the wellness program for our for our fellows in Bali when we were supposed to meet in June. But uh, she's doing this lovely daily newsletter, which we're sharing with them, and many of them found really interesting. So it's just sourcing stuff that works for them right now and uh, and getting through one day at a time. Yeah, it's actually one day at a time because we mm -hmm. don't really know how long this crisis is going to last or what's ahead in what's ahead of us. But once this crisis is over, what is it that you want to do? What is the one thing that you look forward to? I really don't know. <laughs> uh, just, I think what's really hassling me right now mm -hmm. is the idea that I can't just go get on a flight and go home to meet my mom if I have to. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's one thing that's, that I find a little unsettling. The idea that I always, you know, all my life believed if I want to go somewhere, I'm going to just go and do what I have to do, right? So this is, this is To me, this is the loss. Today when we are figuring out what is it that you feel is a loss for you? And for me, it was this feeling that, you know, I feel that I'm stuck for, for now. So I think I would probably go out and, and catch a flight home. Yep. Great. So on that note, Thank you so much. I know it's very late out there. Thank you for <laughs> staying up to chat with me. Please Absolutely. go back and have a great night's sleep. And uh, thank you for all the work you're doing. I, as I, as everyone knows, I'm a Vital Voices fellow. I'm a big fan of Vital Voices. It's my go-to place. So thank you and the rest of the team for keeping mm. us motivated and supporting us through every crisis, not just this. One. No, absolutely. We have to because you all are all the frontline people, right? We are the back end guys. So we have to make sure that you are getting everything you all need. That's that's literally what we see as our job at the moment, making sure that all that is required is being provided to you all right now. Great. Thank you so much, Manila. Good night, Elsa. Good day, right Elsa. <laughs> have a wonderful day. Yeah, um, I'm now going to help with a food run, coordinating thousand mm -hmm. uh, meal distributions on the Eastern yeah. Express Highway from Project yeah. Mumbai. So, thank you, and see you. See everyone tomorrow at 10 a.m. I have Elyani Abdul Rahman joining me for daily reflection. Bye.